morning and welcome to Sunday School with Ms. Barbara. I am Ms. Barbara. I hope that you're having a wonderful day and that you've had an opportunity to watch church, whether it's uh, your church or my church or someone else's church. Or if you have been able to go to church, I really hope that you sat there and you enjoyed getting to be inside the church building. I know that so many churches, including mine, cannot wait to open again so that we can all be around each other and be together. So we're going to continue um, our series that we've been working on, uh, The Armor of God. But first, why don't we start off with today's Bible verse. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Thank you, Anna. Anna did a great job with that Bible verse. Anna is a rising sixth grader, and I've had her in a couple of different my classes, and she's a joy to have, and she did an amazing job. Did you hear in the Bible verse that she, were, uh, that she read, phrase, it said, pray without ceasing. What do you think that means, to pray without ceasing? Ceasing is a big word, and it means stop or ending. So the Bible verse is calling us to pray without ending. So what do you think that means? Do you think that means that I should be praying right now and I should never ever stop all day long and don't eat or anything? That's not what that means. What that means is when we pray for something, do we just want to pray for it one time? If we're having a hard time or someone needs our help, should we just do one little prayer and be done? No, God calls us to continue to pray. He says, pray without ceasing talk to me all the time because that's what we're doing when we're praying right we are talking to god all the time and we want to keep doing that uh, no matter what's going on in our life so when she says pray without ceasing it means talk to god uh, all the time as many times as as much as you can okay she did a great job so we've been talking about our armor of god and uh this is our uh likely what a person from the bible if they were a soldier would have worn uh it's heavy helmet and heavy uh armor uh, really heavy drapery for his uniform there. It looks very hot and very bulky. We've talked about this before, so you probably know the answer, but is this what God wants us to put on? Do you have one of these in your closet? I don't. <laughs> he doesn't really want us to put these clothings on. What does he want us to do? He wants to put on an invisible armor. He wants us to put on things to remind us how we are supposed to be how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to live so that we can grow up as Christians and loving God and doing what it is that God calls us to do. That is it. Do you remember who it is that told us about the armor of God? Paul. Paul was a disciple in the New Testament. So he actually came around after Jesus was gone, which I love that part about the story because he didn't even actually meet Jesus. And in the beginning, he actually made fun of and threw rocks and said bad words to those who did believe in Jesus. And there's gonna be something that happens in his life. We've heard a couple times, does anybody remember what the big thing that happened in his life to make him change? Remember there was a blinding, a blinding light and Jesus is gonna appear and he's gonna to talk to him. His name was Saul at the time, and he didn't like Christians. And Jesus is gonna say, I need you to tell people about me. I need you to continue my story. And that is what Saul, Paul is gonna do. He's gonna change his name to Paul, and he is gonna go on to tell as many people as possible about Jesus and what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of God. And that's what he is gonna do. And so he's the one who is going to write about the armor of God. How about we read it together like we have been doing? Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Do you remember what we put on first? 
I'm going to put on that helmet of salvation. Do you remember what it, salvation meant? That we are saved. That Jesus came to save us. And I like that that goes on our head because that's where we keep our brain and our memories. And we do not ever want to forget that, do we? We don't ever want to forget what Jesus did for us. Then what do we do? We picked up that sword of the spirit. And we talked about the, sword, the spirits being what? Characteristics or things that we want to to achieve. Do you remember them? There are nine of them. Who remembers? Peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Do you remember this? Some of the, some of you probably have them uh, memorized. Those are the ways that God calls us to be all the time. And we have to practice. It, it's not an instant thing. It's not an easy thing. We have to practice those. All right. Then after our sword and our helmet, what do we do? We needed our belt of truth and the belts kind of kind of hold things together doesn't when you when you have um a dress pants or something on you put the belt on it holds it all together holds that shirt in it holds those pants together and i like that that's the belt of truth because we want to wrap ourselves tightly in the truth and what is the truth the bible the gospel that is the truth that we christians know to be true can you think of some of the things that we know to be true God created the heavens and earth. Uh, Jesus was God's son. Jesus died for us. He, Jesus was risen again, right? Those are all true. We, there's lots of truths, but those are some of the big ones that we hold on to. We wrap ourselves tight in. Okay, so we've got our belt on. We've got our sword. We've got our helmet. What else do we need? Sandals of peace. Now, you may not wear sandals. You might wear flip flops or tennis shoes, but back in those days, they would have worn sandals. Now, what is the peace that they're talking about? The peace that we have over ourselves. We can rest in the peace. We can know that God is with us. We can know that Jesus is here for us. That is our peace, knowing that it's okay, right? The peace, peace of mind and peace of body. All right, so we've got our sandals on. What else do we need? We need a breastplate of righteousness. We talked about that was the piece of armor that would go over the front of the soldier and it would protect the what? The heart. It's going to protect the soldier's heart. And I think that's one of the most precious things that we have, don't you? Our heart does more than just pump blood and that's what it does. But what else does it do? It gives us the feelings, doesn't it? We, we talk about feeling with our heart and loving with all of our heart. And that is an amazing gift that God gave us. And we want to protect that. We want to protect that heart. And who is in our hearts? Jesus is in our hearts. God is in our hearts. We invite him into our heart to stay there. And so we want to protect him in there. We don't want anybody else to take him away from us. So that's what he's saying when he says, put on that breastplate. Okay, so we've got all these things on. Um, and what is our last thing that we needed? We need our shield of faith and our shield of faith. We, we talked about goes, you know, he, it goes in front of you and, and it's going to, it's going to, you know, get the, anything that's coming at it, the fiery darts. Remember we talked about those. It's going to stop all of those. And why would we want faith to stop all those? That's the best tool we have. Don't you think? Some people might think the sword's the best thing, but I don't know. A shield is going to block our bodies and our faith is going to block all of those things that come at us that make us other people might say no that's not right there's no god you don't have this under control you don't know what's going to happen you need to worry you need to be afraid you need to be scared we're going to pick up that shield of faith and we're going to hold it in front of us and say no no god's got this i've got this because god's got this right so we put all of our our pieces on and if you remember from the bible verse that i read to you at the bottom of the bible verse do you remember what it's talking about it talks about prayer so as paul is writing and he's telling us to put all of these things on our body he says in the end he says you need prayer so if, if the soldiers going out into battle they've got all their armor they've got their sword they've got their their shield what is paul telling us that they also need They've got God on their side, right? Because we've got our, our, all, all the pieces. So God's with us. But what else do we need? We need prayer. What would prayer do? Prayer would do a lot of things, wouldn't it? Because while we have all these pieces on and we know in our mind and our hearts that we've got everything protecting us. And we could just walk out there, but maybe we should stop 
for a minute and do what? God, help me through this. God, stay with me. God, be with me. God, be loud in my, in my mind, in my ears, in my heart. Help me with this. Show me what to do. Those are uh, the things that God wants us to do. He wants us to hold on to him and then keep talking to him. We talked about that earlier. Keep talking to him. So prayer is a very, very good thing. It's a very easy thing to do um, for some people. Now, I would say that for some people, it's a little bit trickier. Do you have an easy time praying? If someone says, would you like to say the prayer at mealtime? Could you do it? That one's not too hard. What if someone said, could you say the bedtime prayer with me? Could you do that? What if somebody said, you know what? I'm having a really, really hard time today. Would you stand over here and pray with me? Would that, could you do that? We could do that, couldn't we? It might be a little uneasy at first, but have you ever noticed that when you pray, the more you pray and the longer you pray, the easier it becomes? God is like a best friend. He is, and we can talk to him anytime and any place and about anything. So I thought that we might ask big kids because I know that you pray and I pray. Do big kids pray? I think they might. Let's. So I, I asked some big kids and I said, what is it that you pray about? And so I found their in- answers very interesting. They pray to connect and walk with God. That's a wonderful thing to do, isn't it? Like talking to your best friend or holding hands with your best friend and talking to them. It just makes you, it makes you feel connected, doesn't it? Get to know more about them, okay? They also said, when a parent is traveling for work, do your parents travel to work maybe? Like if they go on a business trip, they might go on a plane or a very long car ride, or it could be anybody else in your family. When someone travels, do you pray for them? Do you worry a little bit about mom or dad or someone in the family traveling? Big kids do, and they pray for those people that are traveling away from them that they can't see them, so they're gonna pray for them while they're gone. Uh, they pray when a friend is sick. Do you do that? Do you pray for a friend who might be sick? Like a, it could be a, just a, a small, like the flu or something, or it could be something really, really big that they have to go in the hospital for. Do you pray for your friends if they're ill or hurt? Big kids do too. They pray to know someone is listening to me. Do you ever feel like maybe nobody's listening to me? I know that my children have said that before. Do you feel that way sometimes? It's easy to feel that way when you're a small child, but you know what? It's also easy to feel that way when you're a big kid too. And big kids talk to God because they know God is always listening. He's never busy. He never says, oh, oh, hang on a second. God is always there and he always wants to hear what we have to say. Big kids, pray for comfort. Do you know what comfort means? Comfort's kind of like a hug or something that maybe a snuggly blanket, something that makes you feel better. So maybe you're sick, maybe you're sad, maybe you're worried. Praying to God is gonna give you comfort. It's like wrapping up in a warm blanket or snuggling a special stuffy. That's what big kids do. They pray for that comfort that maybe you get to have when you're, when you're snuggling something. Big kids pray for their own health and for the health of other people. And when we're talking about big kids, that might not mean a scrape or a bruise or even the flu or something that's hospitalized. It can also mean in here health. Do you know what this is called? We know it's a brain, but mental health. Do you know what that means? Sometimes, have you ever just wanted to scream? Ah! because there's so many things in your head that just, they keep talking and talking and talking and telling you things. And sometimes you just need that to stop. Our mental health, we want our mental well-being. We want to have peace in our head. So big kids pray for that for themselves and for other people. And that is, that is a very special thing. Big kids pray about the complicated tasks in life. Now I want you to think for a second about the hardest thing you can think of to do that just makes your brain just go, ah. Maybe uh, it's math, maybe it's reading, Uh, maybe it's something that mom or dad, like riding a bike, or something mom or dad has asked you to do around the house, weeding, have you ever weeded the flower beds or something? Something that's just so hard. The bigger you get, the harder the jobs will be. And big kids are very smart and they say, you know what, this is really, really hard. I need to do it or I want to do it, so I'm gonna ask for help. And who do they turn to? 
they're turning to God to say, help me get through this. Help me to get from here to there. It's a very wise thing that big kids do. Big kids are very smart. And I know that we look up to them. Do you look up to your big sisters, big brothers, big cousins, the big people at church, the youth at church? They have been so great to share so many things with us throughout the Sunday school. And I want to thank them now. I, I always thank them when they do these things for me. But I really, really appreciate it. They're rare, really, really good people. And I love that they told us what they prayed about. It's not always easy to share prayers. Sometimes prayers are just a very personal thing and you don't want to tell. And these people came and they said, it's okay, Miss Barbara. You can tell the younger kids this is what we pray about. And uh, I really, really appreciate that. So do you know how to pray? How do you pray? Well, what do you pray about? Is there rules? No, there's no rules about what you pray about. You can pray about anything. God says, talk to me. Talk to me about whatever it is. You know what, though? You can also pray if you're happy about something. Yeah, people forget that to say, hey, thank you, God. Thank you for this time in my life. I feel so good and I'm happy and everything's going right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you do that? Maybe next time that you're praying, you can say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you've given me. I have a beautiful home. I have a great family. I, I love my new shoes. God wants to hear about everything and he wants you to be thankful. And we are thankful. So sometimes it's, we have to say it out loud, don't we? To thank him. Now, should I pray out loud? I just said that, that we need to say it. We need to pray out loud, but do we have to pray out loud? Like with our, with like I'm doing now, while I'm talking to you. Do you have to do that? No. Do you pray out loud when you're doing your prayers at bedtime? Do you say them out loud for someone else to hear in the room or for, I don't know, your stuffed animals to hear or just for God to hear? Do you do that? Or... Do you pray silently? It's kind of like praying in your head. You know how to do that, right? So you're thinking, dear God, thank you. And you hear it in your head? You can do it that way too. God can hear you in here. He can hear you here. And he can hear you here. It doesn't matter how you pray. He is listening. All right, so how long do you think you should pray? Is there a set time? Do you have like a timer that you turn on? Sometimes in church, when we pray, have you ever noticed that sometimes it's a really long prayer and the preacher keeps on praying and keeps on praying and keeps on praying. Sometimes you get a little, you start to look around and you scratch your ear. <laughs> prayers can be really long and sometimes uh, prayers can be really short. Like if you're praying over your food, you might say, dear God, thank you very much for this food. Amen. And that would be a short prayer. There's no rules. Prayer can be as long as you would like it to be. Well, can you pray with your friends? Can you pray with other people? Or do you have to pray just by yourself? Is that a rule? It's not. Um, you've prayed in Sunday school probably before. Have you prayed with other people around you? Um, have you ever prayed with other people around you and hold hands? Some groups really do that and they really enjoy that. I've seen the youth group do that sometimes and they're in a small group and they all bow their heads and they hold each other's hands. And it's kind of like praying as one big group of people, even though only one person is speaking. That's kind of fun. Uh, we pray in church all the time and people have their head. It could be 50 to 100 people in there. So you can pray with other people. You can pray by yourself. You can do those things. Now, should you always fold your hands? Is there a rule? There's no rule. Miss Jo, who teaches Sunday school amazingly well. We love Miss Jo, don't we? Uh, she was telling the kids in our Sunday school class one time, because somebody said, do I have to, to have to hold my hands together? And she's so wise. And she says, no, you don't have to do that. Did you know that you can just bow your head? You can fold your hands over. You can fold your hands up. You, I've seen people fold their hands in together like this. Did you know some people pray like this with their hands out like this? Have you seen that before? Some people pray with their hands up in the air. Some people pray with their heads down. Some people pray with their heads up looking to God. Some people close their eyes. Some people keep their eyes open. Is there a right or wrong way to pray? Not really. As long as you are talking to God and loving God, there's no wrong way to pray to him. 
All right, well, what about when and where? Do you, ha is there like a set place? Do you have a prayer room? No. Do you have a prayer stool? No, I don't. But if you have one, tell me. I want to know about it. There's no right or wrong place to pray. You can pray in your kitchen. You can pray in your living room. You can pray in your bedroom. You can pray in your car. You could pray while you're roller skating. Uh, but be careful doing that. You could pray while you're jumping rope. Be careful with that one too. <laughs> you can pray at school. Now I know that's tricky. And I know you're all going, Miss Barbara, I cannot pray at school. But is there really a rule that says you can't pray? It says you can't. Then maybe they say you can't pray, ask other people to pray. But before lunch, do maybe you just kind of bow your head and say a little prayer at lunch? Or maybe when you're having a test and you're a little bit nervous or a performance, do you maybe you bow your head a little bit and pray? Yeah. Prayer goes with you everywhere. You can pray anywhere, any time of day. And I like to tell the, the littlest kids that I teach sometimes, you know, we say a prayer whenever we start a Sunday school lesson, and they usually know how to say prayers at the mealtime and at bedtime. Did you know that there are morning prayers, and there are thank you prayers, and there are I'm scared prayers, and there are help me prayers? You can pray anytime and anywhere, right? Now, we're not actually putting the armor on. We talked about that, and we've also talked about but even though we don't put the armor on, we what? We dress for God sometimes, don't we? Do we dress specially for God? We do. We've talked about it in other, um, in other lessons. So I want to uh, show you a different way that somebody in the church dresses for God. This is Brian Greer. Mr. Greer is the mu music minister of our church. Mr. Greer has dedicated himself for the past 13 years to helping those in our congregation enhance their musical gifts and talents. In addition, it is his job to make sure that the people of the choir all sing together and with their best voices. Mr. Greer takes a lot of time to be sure that the choir knows their words and their notes. Each week, the adult choir rehearses for one and a half hours in the evening, sometimes more if a concert or event is in the works. Mr. Greer also helps make music for the church with youth age kids. The Capella Choir rehearses once a week on Sundays and perform once a month during one of the three services. The Capella Choir is made up of boys and girls from 6th to 12th grade. These youth age choir members take their music very seriously and even perform, perform with the adult choir at Christmas as well as in the spring. And they will sing with other youth choir members from around the area for a weekend at a special event called Youth Jam. Singing isn't the only way Mr. Greer fills the church with the sound of music. He also leads several people from the church that have learned to play the bells. These musicians ring their bells when it is their turn and all together they make a beautiful song that is after a lot of hard work and practice. Mr. Greer also sings himself sometimes with one of his quartets at church. Music is a big part of Mr. Greer's job at church and in his life. Mr. Greer wants the sanctuary to be filled with a joyful noise that praises God and makes all those who are attending remember Bi Bible stories, God's promises, and the love that God has for his people here on earth. Each Sunday, Mr. Greer puts on his alb before entering the sanctuary. Wearing this special robe is a way that he can show reverence to God and those who are attending the church service. Mr. Greer sits at the front of the sanctuary, sometimes with the choir, and sometimes on the benches with the clergy members. Mr. Greer has a has a very important job on Sundays and sometimes that means several jobs. He may be conducting the adult choir or the youth choir or the bells or even singing himself. Mr. Greer is also called to lead the congregation at times with the call to worship, hymn, or response. He can even be asked to help solve communion. Mr. Greer spends a lot of time helping to teach musical volunteers in the church, and when he isn't rehearsing or teaching or serving during the church service, Mr. Greer is writing music. Music is a great gift from God to his people, and to use our voices individually and together to praise him is our gift back to God. What a wonderful job that must be for Mr. Greer. Do you think that looks like a very rewarding job? It also looks like a very, very hard job. I happen to know that Mr. Greer spends a lot of time practicing with all of the individuals in church that he leads in a musical way. And I think he loves his job. I think. I just have a pretty good suspicion that he does.
So let's move on to today's Bible story. Uh, it's another soldier in the Bible. And this one's a very interesting one because Jesus is going to encounter this soldier. Read along with me. After Jesus and his disciples ate supper, they walked together to the Garden of Gethsemane. When they got there, Jesus asked three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to join him in prayer. But while they prayed, the disciples became very sleepy. And they soon fell a sound asleep. Jesus didn't see them asleep at first. He was trying very hard to be at peace with what was about to happen to him. He was going to be crucified. When he looked around for his disciples and saw them sleeping, he woke them. But they fell asleep again and then again. They simply could not keep their eyes open or their minds alert. Even though they loved Jesus and wanted to help him, the third time he found them sleeping, he said, Sleep now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And that's when the disciples finally woke up. But instead of helping Jesus pray, they watched as Judas, another of Jesus' disciples, lead a crowd of temple servants towards Jesus to take him away. As the servants walked away with Jesus, the disciple Peter whipped out his sword and cut off the ear of a servant of the high priest. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus immediately healed his ear and told Peter to put his sword away. After the servant's ear was healed and Peter had learned a good lesson in how to love his enemy, Jesus was led away to deface the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the highest council of the Jews and was made up of 71 members. They would decide whether or not to put Jesus to death. Jesus lived according to his own teaching. He loved God and he loved his neighbor as himself, no matter what. This is the lesson he taught us every time he healed someone, even the servant who helped take Jesus away to be crucified. It's a very interesting story that the soldier or person who was aiding the soldiers to come and take Jesus away is going to be healed by Jesus. So here's this person whose job it is to take Jesus away, to have him tried, and then he will be executed. And Peter says, no, you can't take my Lord. And he gets angry and he, and he cuts, cuts off the ear of this, of this soldier, the soldier's helper. And what does Jesus do? He's going to heal the man. He's going to heal the man that is going to help take him away and will help ha ha what happens next with his trial and, and uh, his crucifixion. I think that's a great lesson for us to learn. Have you ever heard, love your enemies? This man really wasn't Jesus' enemy. He, didn't, he was doing what he was supposed to do. But Jesus loved on him anyway, even though he knew what was going to happen next. And that's something that we are called to do as well. We need to love the people, even though maybe they're doing something that we don't like or that hurts us. We do have to find love in there. And we have to find forgiveness in there. Now, Sir Dwayne, he needs some forgiveness. Not the same kind of forgiveness. <laughs> All right, guys, tell you a story, guys. Sir Dwayne had all of his armor on last week. Do you remember Aiden helped him put it all on and he was looking good. And then he got a little cocky and he said, I can get myself dressed. It didn't well, go well, folks. It did not go well. And I had to ask Hannah to help me. Jim. Let's see, what do you want to start with? Let's start with the sword. Where does the sword of the spirit go? In his hand, silly Sir Dwayne. All right, so now you've got his belt of truth. Where should that go? Phew, hold those pants up. All right, some other stuff looks funny. That's not where his shirt goes. Oh, thank goodness. There's his helmet of salvation. Mm, maybe we'll try that again, close. There we go. There's his breastplate of righteousness. Just stick it right there on top of his, oh, his undershirt. He has a red undershirt. Perfect. He can't even keep his shoes, his sandals, and he's got his shield. Where does the shield go? Not on his pants, silly Sir Dwayne. He's got to be feeling better. All right, what about his sandals? Where do you think those go? Do 
You did a great job. Can you give him a high five? Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Sir Dwayne needed a lot of help today, didn't he? I appreciate you helping him, and I really think that he appreciates it, too. Great job, Hannah. Now, since we have been talking about the power of prayer today and how God wants us to pray before we even take that first step, and he wants us to always talk to him as much as possible, just like we would a best friend, and I thought, who better to help us understand prayer than Ms. Anne Dvorak, she's amazing at praying, and I know that you're going to enjoy listening to what it is that she has to tell us today. Hi, everybody. Well, we're a little different today filming because it's so hot outside that Mrs. Barbara Shipley and I said, no way are we going to be out there. So we're inside tonight where it's cool and refreshing, and it's so good to see her and to chat about Sunday school. Well, I was just wondering, do you ever have a problem? Is it something that you're excited about? Something you're thankful for? Well, all you need to do is call upon Jesus. Call his name. Jesus, dear God, Heavenly Father, and talk to him. Because that's what Jesus wants us to do, is to talk to him. Before prayer tonight, there's a little hymn. You know, they're the songs that we sing in church on Sunday mornings that come out of the book that's right in front of you. You know, sometime uh, Pastor Kelchner will say, now let's turn to page 329 in our hymnals. Well, there's a hymn in there, and the name of it is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And in this hymn, it talks about prayer and what we should do. It was written by a man named Joseph, I can't pronounce his last name, but that doesn't matter, who was born in 1819 in Ireland. And he came over to Canada and lived, and he enjoyed writing. So this is his little hymn, which was later put to music. And we, but I'm not going to sing for you tonight, so here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I will read you the second verse. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. So you see, boys and girls, everything, we can take it to the Lord in prayer. I had some things going on in my life today that I was praying. I didn't pray, and then I prayed some more. So it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And I hope that shortly we'll be able to hear this being sung at church. All righty, let us put our hands together and bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are such a wonderful friend. You listen to everything we say, whether it's happy or sad or thankful, you're right there. And I know you're listening because I have experienced where I have prayed for something and I had to wait a while, but it was answered. Please give all of us patience to know that you hear us, you understand us, and as I always say, you'll never leave us. Thank you for your many blessings. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much, Miss Ann Dvorak. She did a great job as always. Are there some hymns that you like? Or maybe there's some hymns that you hear mom or grandma humming, or maybe even dad humming sometimes while they're doing the work. 
I hum sometimes. I notice that when I'm sewing, I start humming a, a, a hymn that I like, or maybe even if I'm rinsing the dishes. Hymns are a wonderful way to bring us closer to God. And I think of hymns as a prayer. I do. I think the people who wrote them, wrote them as a prayer as well. I hope my prayer for you is that you have a good week and that you take some time for God. Always make time for Him. Talk to Him anytime you need to. He wants to hear from you. Know that you are loved. Have a good week.